I am uh, Dr. Erin Ribka. I am uh, in a, my practice is limited to veterinary dentistry and oral surgery. It's all I do. I have a, a full-time dentistry only practice here in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I am going to talk to you guys tonight about pediatric dentistry. Um, please, oh, okay. This is the part, I can't see my mouse. So when I'm trying to click on stuff, uh, I, I, can't, I can't see what I'm clicking on. It's taking me a little bit of time. Feel free though, I've got the little question box open on my screen. And if you have any questions or anything, just go ahead and type them in and I'm assured that they're going to pop up and I will see them and I'll be able to kind of answer them as we go along. All right, feel free to stop me at any time. Um, it might take me a little bit to uh, figure out how to respond to you. Um, so I think if that's all right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So pediatric dentistry, I mean, I'm, I'm going to assume that most of you guys are probably general practitioners. Um, and I always preface this this um, lecture by saying that really it's the general practitioners, the, the technicians, the assistants who really are the first line um, and you guys are absolutely key to uh, being able to identify these pediatric issues. Because I am no longer in general practice, the, um, the only baby animals I see are the ones that you guys send. So uh, it, it actually, it, it absolutely is super key and you guys are really important to um, identifying these issues and getting these animals help early when it can be the most effective. Um, we can make a huge difference in these patients' lives by intervening early and appropriately. Okay. Uh, that's not right. How do I, how do I make this go? Oh, because I've got it on here, I think. Maybe there we go. Look at that. Okay, so this is just the the kind of disclaimer that uh, a lot of the images and things in here are reprint are used with permission of Manson Publishing, um, and a lot of them come from this color handbook. Um, you can. This book actually was really great. I love this book. I used it all the time in general practice. It actually sat in a drawer in the dental suite. And as I was learning more and more, when I found something that I didn't recognize or wasn't sure what to do, I could look it up in the book. And there it was. Um, and, you know, with some helpful tips. So um, it is available online through our website or through some of these other, other places as well. Okay. So we're gonna start first with um, what normal occlusion looks like and kind of emphasizing to everybody that um, a bite evaluation is an important part of, um, of every puppy, kitten, baby animal uh, wellness visit. So when they're coming in for those vaccines uh, and things, absolutely should, um, I'm going to turn off the video for a minute because it's just going to bug me knowing that everybody's watching me move my hands all around. So we'll just go to the screen. Um, so every time um, a puppy or kitten comes in for vaccine exams, uh, things like that, you should always be checking the bite. You should also be making sure that you check both sides because we can have differences between right and left side. We'll go into that a little bit as well later on in the lecture. Uh, a lot of the pediatric dental issues, malocclusions can be quite painful or, and they may set the animal up for lifelong problems. So um, we, we do want to identify problems early. We want to intervene early if necessary, uh, and we can really improve patient health, well-being, and client satisfaction as well. So this is just a, a schematic of what normal occlusion looks like. We call it a scissors bite. You have um, a nice little overjet. Here, I've got a photograph of it here. And the 
maxillary incisors should sit just, just rostral to the mandibular incisors. The lower canine should fit right into this diastema here between the third incisor and the maxillary canine. And then we call this a scissors bite because again, this looks like pinking shears. These teeth don't actually meet up. These premolars don't actually meet one another until you get to the back, the upper fourth premolar and the lower first molar, what we call carnasal or cutting teeth. Um, but this is, this is considered a normal, a normal canine or feline occlusion. Uh, uh, feline cats just have fewer uh, teeth. Um, so first thing we're going to talk about are the class one malocclusions. Class one malocclusion just means that one or more teeth may be out of proper alignment. All right. Class one malocclusions are not skeletal defects. So it's not a discrepancy between the length of the jaws. Um, and it's not necessarily um, genetic. They can be hereditary. So things like this. This is a really common class one malocclusion that we see. Uh, it's also called Lance canines um, and often in Shelties. <laughs> Shelties are definitely overrepresented. Um, but again, non skeletal malocclusion. So there is a lot of, um, you can see a lot of gingivitis around here and just a lot of uh, tartar and debris buildup. Uh, in this space. Um, in cats, Persians can be, are overrepresented. Uh, we can also see it a lot in Scottish Terriers, Italian Greyhounds. Um, in those breeds, it is likely a hereditary thing. Um, pretty common, or not uncommon, I guess I should say. And uh, like I said, um, it, it can set them up for problems going forward. All right, and I just lost my little, uh-oh, I really did, do, oh, there we go. Technology, so good. Uh, all right, okay, there we go. Um, sorry, guys. Um, okay, so because these, the maxillary canine is lance or mesioversed, meaning it's pointing too far um, rostrally, it points towards the front of the mouth too much, and we lose this little, here it is, um, we lose this normal space that's between the third incisor and the canine. So this canine is pointing forward when it should be pointing more downward, we end up with these pockets uh, because the teeth are too close together and they're going to retain a lot of debris and plaque and infection. Um, we can end up with these pseudo pockets or actual pockets. Um, when they're really severe like this, you can see that this um, the canine tooth is actually touching that incisor, uh, which really just increased the risk or the severity of the periodontal disease that we can see. Um, the other thing that can happen with these is the mandibular canines can actually get pushed laterally, so towards the lips, um, and that can even be so severe as to cause trauma to the upper lip, catching on the bottom canines. Um, you know, and again, canines are just really important teeth. Um, we like to talk about how dogs use their mouths kind of as a hand, and the fingers of that hand are the four canine teeth. So these are really important teeth. They're important to the, to the strength and structures of the jaws, and they're just important to the to the pet for moving through, <laughs> moving through their daily, their daily routines, their daily um, lives. And this tooth here, if it's left like this, uh, is now set up for a lifetime of problems and possibly even tooth loss eventually if it's not, if it's not treated, okay? Um, 
here's kind of what it looks like from the front. And like I was saying before, with the, the mandibular canines can actually be pushed out to the, the lateral side. So, and this can catch the, the maxillary lip and cause trauma. So some of the ways that we talk about treating these um, orthodontics, there, you know, if you've got the right patient and the right client, we can treat these orthodontically and we can move the teeth back into a more normal, uh, more normal occlusion. Um, we do, sometimes we can reduce the height of the crown. We just actually cut the tooth and then do what's called vital pulpectomy or vital pulpotomy, uh, vital pulp therapy and keep the tooth in the mouth. The last, res uh, the last resort, of course, is extraction of the tooth. And we try and avoid that if we can in this, in this important tooth. So here's a case of mine from a few years ago. This was actually the perfect client, uh, really good dog. And the client was a fourth year veterinary student. So absolutely perfect client. She really wanted to do what, what, whatever she could. Uh, this is a, a little dachshund. His name is Andui because we're here in Louisiana. And he didn't have a really terrible, terrible lance. You can see that the, the, the canine is not actually touching the incisor, but this, this space here, this diastema is really, really reduced. And as a result, the, um, the mandibular canine was actually infrarupted. So the fact that the mandibular canine was kind of trying to fit into this spot and banging up against this tooth was preventing that uh, the mandibular canine from actually erupting all the way. So this is how we fixed it. We put a little composite extension here, it's called a snowman, put that on this canine tooth. We put an anchor here around the fourth premolar and the molar, and we use a chain. And we just gradually, over time, we shorten that chain and we tip this canine right back into a more, a more appropriate position. And this is what we ended up with. Um, fortunately, we got to this dog early enough that the, um, the bottom canine was able to just continue erupting right into its, its proper position. So I've seen this dog since, he's doing great. Um, mom is now a graduate uh, uh, baby doc and, and working here in town. And she sends me lots of pediatric patients um, because she's well-versed in, in what can happen. Um, let's see, I see something flashing at me. Um, so just go ahead, you don't need to even raise your hand, just type in your question if you've got one, I think. Here we go, something's working. Uh, how long will it take to move the canine tooth into its normal position? So that all depends. Um, there's not one answer because it, uh, oh, wait, the, the tooth that's being moved, the upper canine that we're moving, it's usually pretty quick, <laughs> actually, um, usually just a couple of weeks. Um, it depends. There are a lot of things that you have to consider when you're doing this. Um, <clears throat> how frequently you shorten and how much you shorten that chain. You don't want to do it too fast. You know, orthodontics is, is actually a little bit complicated. Um, we can't do it too fast or we can actually damage the tooth. Um, so we want to take it slowly, gradually. And, um, but usually it only takes a few weeks and then we kind of leave everything in place. Um, the nice thing about these is that, uh, because of the way these canine teeth fit together, uh, it's a self-retaining bite. So once you have the teeth in the proper position, um, we don't need to make retainers like we would for human children. My human children all have retainers um, because the teeth keep themselves um, and each other in line. So um, it can be, uh, the next question is whether this is bilateral or unilateral, and it can be either. Um, I, most of them that I've seen have been more unilateral, worse on one side than the other, but we can see this bilateral. In Shelties, I've seen this bilaterally for sure. Um, 
the next question is, what is the best age to refer this? Um, first time it's noticed or give it time to see if it self-corrects. I would always, always say the first time it's noticed. Um, don't, don't wait. These generally are not going to self-correct. Um, and I can't, oops, sorry guys. Um, they're not going to self-correct because things are going to be banging on each other. The teeth are going to be hitting each other in inappropriate ways. Um, causing trauma to the teeth or to the soft tissue. Um, and yeah, as soon as you see it, <laughs> refer it. Um, how do you correct the mandibular canine if it is pushed buckly? Ah, yeah, so we can, it's, it's another tipping motion, but it's tipping it back the other way. So we actually have to anchor it the opposite side of the mouth um, and we pull it back that way. I have not gotten to do one of those yet. Um, the one Sheltie that I really, really wanted to do it on, um, the owners were not interested in pursuing any treatment at all, which was kind of a bummer. But um, I think she actually ended up extracting the upper canine and just living with the crooked bottom canine. Uh, but it's a similar type of thing. It's an orthodontic, uh, an orthodontic appliance. Okay. Um, so the next one um, that we'll look at, and this, this does occur in, I mean, all of these things occur in puppies, clearly, because um, we're here on, on pediatric dentistry, forgetting where I'm at. Um, okay, so the next one, this is still a class one Nile occlusion. As you can see from this picture, the jaw lengths are normal. All right, this is an appropriate jaw length. These maxillary canines are just, in front of the mandibular canines. And the mandibular canine is in the right spot in that it's wanting to go into that diastema between, excuse me, the third incisor and the maxillary canine. However, it is too narrow. So we, the, the jaw is narrow or the tooth has come up too narrow and is impinging on the palate, all right? This is a really, this is one of the more common ones that we see for sure. Um, and I can't tell you how many golden doodles, labradoodles, poodle oodles, um, one that I just saw today actually, uh, really, really common um, for them to have this base narrow set up. It can be, it's, it's, it can be hugely variable how narrow these teeth are and whether or not they're causing trauma. Um, but uh, like I said, super common, um, and can be incredibly painful. And if you just think about little needle point puppy teeth, um, and how sharp they are, and, uh, just imagine if you had one of those going one or two of those going into your palate every single time you closed your mouth. So what I like to tell people is that when I was in general practice and seeing puppies all the time, I mean, how many times do you get a puppy who just doesn't want you to look in its mouth? It's mouthy and you think, oh, it's just, you know, and maybe the owner tells you, oh yeah, he's kind of mouthy. We think he's teething, whatever. He just doesn't really like his mouth messed with. Well, that is, in my opinion, a sign that you really need to get in there and look. You need to get in there um, and you need to find out why is this puppy so mouthy. Um, a lot of the time, a lot of the time, I actually would find something like this. So it's mouthy because they're painful and they don't want you messing around in there. In cases like this, so even though this is a normal jaw length at this point in time, Again, this is a puppy, these are baby teeth. If you leave this and choose not to do anything, um, chances are good that you could, this dog could develop a jaw length discrepancy. And the reason for that is because when these canine teeth are stuck into the palate like that, it can retard the, the growth of the mandibles. And the, the maxillas and the mandibles grow at different rates. The maxillas tend to grow first. They don't grow simultaneously. They grow in kind of bursts and, and 
stops and starts, um, the maxillas tend to grow first. And if the mandibular canines are stuck into the maxilla, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to affect or it could very well affect the, the growth of, of the lower jaw. So we want to get rid of these. Um, we can get some pretty significant um, soft tissue trauma. These are actual like little punctures um, and that's purulent material in there. Um, they can be pretty bloody. It can get all the way to the bone. Certainly it can cause um, osteomyelitis. We can see oronasal fistulas form from this kind of thing. Um, so the first and most important thing is don't wait don't wait until, oh, we're going to have the dog back in six months to neuter it, and we'll just take the teeth out then. Um, you do not want to wait. You want to, you want to fix this. You want to remove the, the offending teeth as soon as possible. Um, so, like I said, it's not a skeletal malocclusion, but it can progress to that. Um, and it also, we can also see this in conjunction with a skeletal malocclusion. So if you don't do anything, um, or even if you do do something, it's also possible for this to occur in the adult dentition. <laughs> um, so we always want to make sure that uh, we're, we're warning people that even if we take out these deciduous canines, uh, and I usually take out the deciduous mandibular incisors at the same time, um, well, it depends. Uh, for a class of two, I would. I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. Um, but if you take out the deciduous canine teeth, the mandibular ones, and you get rid of the source of pain and potential infection, you definitely need to inform the owners that you cannot guarantee that the adult teeth are not going to come up in exactly the same improper position and cause the same problem. Um, and this is what you get if, if that happens. So it is possible for the adult canines to come in base narrow also and cause significant, um, significant trauma and pain. Same kind of sequela that we can see with the baby teeth. Um, although in the permanent teeth, we like to treat this um, we like to treat this with orthodontics, with inclined planes, um, or, or some other um, fun little tricks that we have depending on how severe the problem is. Um, I'm gonna move ahead. This is an inclined plane. This is just an example of, of, a, of a metal inclined plane. So this is a, an appliance that's created in an orthodontics lab and it, sits down over the maxillary teeth and there are um, ramps built in here. There's inclines built in here that guide the max the mandibular canines, guide them into uh, a more lateral um, formation so that it actually pushes the teeth out. Okay. Um, so if if it's a very mild uh, lingual version or base narrow, if it's not really too bad. It's not jamming all the way up into the palate. You know, maybe it's catching on the gingiva a little bit. Um, sometimes we can do really simple things like gingivectomy. And in gingivectomy, we just cut out a kind of a wedge. Ooh, I have an example of it coming up. Um, we cut out a little wedge of gingiva here. We can kind of remodel the bone a little bit if we have to. We can put crown extensions, so kind of like we did with the um, with that previous case with the Lance canine, we put that extension with the composite. Um, we can do that and that kind of will guide the teeth out as well. All right. Um, I, I will, um, like I told this, this client today, um, had exactly this problem. It was worse on one side than the other. We went in and we'd taken out the baby teeth uh, a few months ago. I think that was back in February. Um, dog was pretty small now. Dog is big now. <laughs> dog, uh, it's a labradoodle, golden doodle. Um, and her permanent canines are coming in. 
I think she's going to be just fine, but the left side is still just a little tiny bit, like maybe it's going to be a little bit tight. Um, and that's a dog that I absolutely told them to try ball therapy and getting an appropriate sized ball and just working with the dog actively a couple of times a day to get it to bite down on this ball over and over and over again for about 10 minutes at a time to try and just push that tooth just a little bit more out so that she doesn't end up with trauma, okay? So always worth a try. Don't, it doesn't always work, but I have seen it work sometimes. So um, it's always worth a try. Uh, and it should be started um, as those permanent canines start to come in not once they're already in, it's gonna be much harder to do anything with it. You wanna start it very quickly, very soon. Um, and I just lost my train of thought there. There's another question. How long will the incline apparatus be in place? Again, it depends. It depends on how severe, it depends on the dog, it depends on how well they tolerate it. But generally in dogs, we're talking about weeks, not months and not years. It's, it's usually just a matter of weeks. Once we get the teeth where we want them to be, again, this is a self-retaining bite. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, once they're out of the traumatic phase of the bite and they're just into kind of a self-retaining thing. <clears throat> For those of you, I never had braces as a kid, but um, my kids all have braces and it's, it's kind of a lifelong thing. Um, unfortunately for them, <clears throat> retainers forever. That's what my daughter was told. Excuse me, sorry. Um, so another thing to remember, uh, just one more reason that, that x-ray, that radiology, dental x-ray is so very important um, when we're doing any kind of dentistry, when we're doing extractions, even when we're doing things like this, when we're trying to assess <clears throat> occlusion. So if I'm gonna go in and, and tell these folks, yeah, okay, we need to take out some teeth, um, there, there are no permanent third incisors in this dog. These are deciduous third incisors right here. These are permanent central incisors and, and center incisors, middle incisors, but these lateral ones are baby teeth. And there is no permanent tooth bud back behind there at all. So if we were to take out this dog's third incisors, they would never, I mean, there are no permanent ones there to grow behind. So we would have to make sure that we've informed the owner. You know, it might be that these baby teeth, that these deciduous teeth need to come out. Um, <clears throat> but don't tell the owner that if you take these out, there is definitely going to be a permanent tooth behind it. Because in this dog's case, there are no permanent teeth behind there. Um, so another question, what's the time frame to correct or achieve movement? And again, like I said, it's, it's generally weeks. Okay, so now we're going to get into the class two malocclusion. Um, we used to call this overshot. This is the class two malocclusion. And you can see that the, um, there's, it's actually not that the maxillas are too long, but the mandibles are generally too short. Okay. So you have extra space between the maxillary and mandibular incisors. And you can see that that mandibular canine is a little shy of, of the diastema. We often will see this in conjunction with base narrow canines. All right. Um, again, maxillas and mandibles grow at different rates. This um, this is a skeletal malocclusion. It is considered to be genetic. And um, if you've got a, a breeding pair that is throwing these, you should probably recommend that they not breed these dogs again. Okay. Um, and these puppies shouldn't be bred. Um, the, this, this malocclusion, we see it all the time, and it comes in every shape and flavor. Um, my own dog has this pretty severely, but he's not up here, so I can't put the video on and show you. Um, he got a little lucky. Uh, so again, um, he got lucky because his jaw is just short enough that his canine comes up 
just behind, um, but doesn't impinge on the other teeth. Uh, you know, again, we want the we want that mandibular canine to be in front of the maxillary canine. Um, yeah. So again, these can be quite painful, uh, and you can see in this in this image, you see how these mandibular um, incisors are. I'm sorry, this is my phone's about to die, and that's my only pointer. Um, but the mandibular incisors back there are very probably <laughs> catching on the rugi of the palate. So even that can can cause a, a retardation of the growth of the mandibles. Sorry, I got all my cat out of my, my room real quick. A little extra noise back here. Um, and you can see in this case, this is also a base narrow. So not only are the incisors catching and really stuck back there behind the rostral palate, but the mandibular canines are stuck in the gingiva um, palatal and distal to the maxillary canines. Okay, so really painful. Um, none of us would want to live with this. Um, here's an image of, of the kind of trauma that, and this is that same dog in the previous picture. So this is the kind of trauma that we can see. Um, you know, nice bleeding holes. Those are fairly deep. And you can even sort of see these little punctures, little spots in the palate here. That's from the lower incisors. So they're just sitting in there causing all sorts of pain and trauma. Very painful. Uh, and again, we can see infection, we can see osteomyelitis, we can see oronasal fistulas develop. Um, the sooner, the better. So again, you see this in that eight-week-old puppy, seven-week-old puppy that's in for its first set of vaccines. You want to get those deciduous teeth out now, tomorrow. Don't wait until they're six months old. Do it as soon as you are absolutely able. If you're not comfortable doing it, refer it to somebody who is. Um, we can make a big, big difference in their lives, making them much, much more comfortable. And know that if, if you don't intervene, there is no chance for the lower jaw to grow to its full potential, right? Because they're, those mandibular canines are just acting like a break on, on jaw growth. Um, there is no guarantee, however, that taking those teeth out is going to mean that the dog ends up with a normal jaw. So absolutely need to um, let owners know that you can't guarantee it, but you can be pretty sure if you don't intervene, it absolutely will not grow. So um, much better, much better out than in, in this case. Um, this, this is a case that I absolutely take out the deciduous um, incisors as well as uh, the canines. It's also really important to make sure the owners know that the permanent teeth may also need treatment of some sort. There is no knowing um, at this point what that might be. So again, I intervene. Um, we make sure that, we, that the owners are fully informed that they're gonna have to come back as soon as those bottom canines begin to erupt so that we can reevaluate and then talk about what types of treatment may be necessary. Um, some treatments can't be performed until the dog is more like eight or nine months of age, uh, but I like to see them as soon as those mandibular canines come in so that we can start to get an idea. Um, so also just um, a little reminder here that you can't tell just from looking at the dog, right? This doesn't look all that bad. Um, but when you lift the lip and look in here, um, this is what you've got. And this is kind of, in, in an adult dentition, this is kind of the worst case scenario, is to have that mandibular canine stuck exactly behind or exactly palatal to the maxillary canine. Because in that situation, 
we can't do orthodontics on that dog. That is a dog that's going to have to be treated with either extraction or crown reduction and vital pulpotomy. Here's a better, uh, better picture of how those mandibular incisors get stuck, um, get stuck behind the palate and can also retard the forward growth of the, of the mandibles. All right, let me see. There's a couple of questions here. Let me scroll down. Um, so first question was, do you remove all upper and lower deciduous incisors and canines? Um, I generally remove all of the lower deciduous incisors and canines. Sometimes there are upper incisors that I will also remove. It all depends on, like I said, these come in every shape, color, and flavor. And um, it's, it's a very uh, individualized treatment plan, I guess we could say. Um, but most commonly, all lower deciduous incisors and the lower canines. Yes, sometimes maxillary as well. Yes, good question. Do you risk damaging the adult teeth when trying to extract the lower deciduous canines and incisors? Absolutely. And I've got some pictures of that coming up um, a little bit later in the lecture. Um, so, Beneath all of these very long rooted deciduous teeth, oh, let me get to it because I've got, I know I have images of that coming up. So just hang on to that question. I am coming to it. I promise I'll get to it. Okay. Um, and we can talk about it more. Um, okay. So here is uh, a dog with the um, permanent dentition. So this is a, a more normal um, jaw length. Um, this is just the example of the gingival wedge that I was talking about earlier. So a little bit tight on, on this site and we just cut out a wedge shaped piece of gingival tissue. This is one that I might also be putting a, what we call a coronal extension or a crown extension here um, just to lengthen that and, and help, um, help guide it more laterally and out of a traumatic occlusion. All right, so again, this is kind of that worst case scenario in the adult teeth. So that little puppy that we saw a little bit ago that had the teeth just exactly palatal to the, to the maxillary canines, uh, and I said, you can't guarantee that it's not gonna happen in the adult dentition this is in the adult dentition. So you can see that there's just no place, when we talk about tipping teeth out using in-kind planes and um, trying to get, go one way or the other, there's nowhere to move this tooth. Um, so the best thing that we end up doing, um, or what we generally end up doing, is crown reduction, coronal amputation, and vital pulp therapy. So we cut the canine tooth to the level of the incisor, generally. That's going to remove any kind of trauma, hopefully. Um, but in general, that's true. And then we do what's called vital pulp therapy. And the way I explain it to clients is it's kind of like a mini root canal. We take out just the, um, the coronal five to seven millimeters of pulp, and we do some special fillings in there. It's a, um, a three-layer technique uh, to help entice the dentin to grow over the pulp. And what this technique allows is for the tooth to continue to mature, all right? We, when teeth are young, they are mostly pulp with a little bit of dentin and all the enamel that they're ever going to have, right? Which in dogs is less than a millimeter. So as the tooth matures, the pulp gets thinner, the dentin gets thicker, and it's the dentin that actually gives the teeth most of their strength and structure. So we really want um, teeth to mature. We want them to, to lay down more dentin and become stronger. Um, so that they're not just kind of a thin layer of enamel and dent and around a big old bloody pulp. Um, this technique keeps the tooth alive, which is why it's called vital, vital pulp, live pulp therapy. Um, and it, it allows the tooth to continue to mature and um, continue to, to strengthen. 
which is important in the mandibular canines because uh, there's not a lot of bone in the rostral mandible. It's mostly canine tooth, um, especially when you're talking about little tiny dogs, right? Um, so this is, this is the procedure that, we, that I most often use. Um, do I put these young pups on NSAIDs post-op? Um, often, yes. Um, even, uh, even if it's just for a couple of days, these guys really, um, they bounce back really well. And I'll say that, um, you know, even if it's just a single dose, I, I use Medicam most often in my practice, uh, what I'm really comfortable with. Um, and frankly, most of these dogs that I'm doing are over eight weeks. Even more of them are over 12 weeks. Um, it's rare that I get them really, really young. So even if I'm doing just a single dose, um, if I feel that that's safe for the dog, then yes, I will do that. But once you get rid of the painful teeth going up into their palate, these guys feel great. <laughs> so um, yeah, they usually bounce back really, really quickly. Has a canine ever died after this kind of procedure? Yes, after vital pulp therapy? Yes, absolutely. It needs to be done um, properly. It needs to be done well. Um, there are, are mistakes that can be made, um, improper handling of the pulp tissue, improper placement of the, um, the medicaments and the, the restorations, especially the medicament that we put in there. So yeah, you, it, it, it takes some, some skill and definitely some advanced training. Um, will the vital pulp treatment ever need to be replaced with a root canal? Hopefully not. No, not if you do it right. It should just stay alive. Now, if the dog loses the restoration and breaks the tooth again, maybe. But um, generally, if you do it right and you do it well, uh, it shouldn't require, it, doesn't, it does not routinely require a root canal at a later date. How about that? Um, you do need to check the restorations. This is a filling. So just like a filling in our teeth, they can crack, they can break, they can fall out. Um, so we do need to, to make sure that um, we're maintaining them properly. All right, the next skeletal malocclusion, well, the next malocclusion, also a skeletal malocclusion, is called a class three. Um, we used to, like I said, call this undershot. This is considered quote unquote normal in certain breeds. Um, there are breeds that have been intentionally bred to have this malocclusion, um, but we can see it in other breeds too, like this one. Um, German Shepherds are not supposed to have an underbite, um, but here you go, here you have it. Um, my youngest child actually has this malocclusion and I had a, a really fun, and by fun I mean not really fun at all, talk with the orthodontist about how this is the most difficult malocclusion for human orthodontists to fix. Um, this is why you end up in headgear. Um, as, as my kids did. This is a pretty severe one, obviously. Um, so here's a more mild one. Um, this, is, um, this is closer to what we would call an even bite or a very mild class three. Um, but if you just kind of shoot forward and you know, look into your crystal ball into the future in six or eight years, what are this dog's teeth gonna look like? Um, we've all seen them. The, the nice lab who's got just this perfectly even, even bite where all of his incisors hit exactly on top of each other the way they are not supposed to. And they can actually wear their teeth um, all the way down to the gum line or beyond. They can wear it down into the pulp canals like this over here. So that is an explorer going right into a pulp canal. Um, but this is just really, really severe attrition. You can see there's attrition on the canine teeth as well, um, all the way down in here. This other picture, excuse me, is a boxer that I did a couple of years ago, and you can see this really, really severe um, wear into the soft tissues. Um, these are from the, the incisors, digging down into these soft tissues here, and again, um, wore all the way through and exposed the root of that canine. Um, so again, I, I would argue that this is painful. And just because boxers 
are bred to have this underbite doesn't mean that it's a good thing for them. It doesn't mean that it's pain-free. It doesn't mean that it's trauma-free. It doesn't mean that it's not going to lead to um, sometimes pretty um, significant uh, problems in the in the future. So, um, yeah, there's there's a little bit of a soapbox from me um, about this. I do think they should be treated. They don't all have to be. Many of them do not have to be treated at all, but I think they should be evaluated and treated when necessary. Um, once you've got pulp exposure, even if it's just on those, those little incisors, they do require either extraction or a root canal. Um, you can't just leave open pulp like that. It's not good, not nice. Um, all right, this is a class four malocclusion. Again, what we used to call a rye bite. There are several different flavors of this one as well. They can be front to back, side to side, up and down. Um, but kind of the big thing here with, a, with the rye bite, if you look, is that the maxillary midline does not line up with the mandibular midline. They're, they're off. So look at the bite from the front and also from the sides. So this is the same dog. This is the left side of that dog. And that is a pretty nice looking bite. He's got a little contact between the incisors there. And you know, eh, it's not so bad, right? Um, but if we go to the other side, this is what we've got. So you always got to look at both sides. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> mandibular canine is actually hitting that third incisor and it's, Surprise, surprise, it's bumping that incisor out to the side. Um, you just really need to evaluate these again from every angle, from the front, from both sides, if it's purely cosmetic, and it might be. I've seen these that are, there's no trauma anywhere. It's just a funky looking mouth, no big deal. No blood, no foul, right, no harm, um, but, if there is trauma, and that can be, it doesn't have to be trauma to the soft tissue, it can be trauma to the other teeth as well, like in, like in this example here, treatment is recommended, all right? Um, and again, we can talk about orthodontics, it could be selective extraction, in this case, I would, you know, if you mm, get them when they're young and take out that, that uh, lateral incisor there, it's not a small tooth, that's a big, um, that's a big incisor, it's, more like a mini canine is what I tell people, but um, I would take that out because it's much easier to take that tooth out than the mandibular canine, um, which, you know, nobody wants to fracture a jaw taking out a mandibular canine, but it happens. Okay, persistent deciduous teeth. I promise we are, I have not forgotten about that other question either. I am gonna get back to it, I promise it's coming. Um, persistent deciduous teeth, we've all seen this, um, very, very common, uh, particularly in small dogs. Uh, I, once, <laughs> I once actually saw a Yorkshire Terrier that had two complete sets of teeth. He had every baby tooth and every permanent tooth in his mouth at the same time. I think he was five years old. It was horrible, um, which is really horrifying, and his breath was really, really bad. Um, okay, so the most common cause of this problem is an incorrect eruption path of the permanent tooth. All right. When an adult tooth erupts normally, it puts pressure on the deciduous tooth root, and that leads to resorption and exfoliation. Okay, super simplified. We think that's probably mostly how it works. There are a whole lot of different, different things going on there. But for the most part, if you don't have a permanent adult tooth um, coming in in the right place, it is not going to trigger the appropriate response in the deciduous tooth to resorb and eventually fall out on its own. Okay. Um, real quick, uh, what would be the indications of endodontically treating a small incisor as opposed to just extracting it? Client preference, honestly. Um, client preference. Um, some um, show dogs, uh, now I don't there are a whole lot of rules about that, and I don't want to get into that, um, but um, there are certain show dogs who can have a certain number of teeth extracted 
or orthodontically treated or, you know, what have you. But um, yeah, the clients, it's owner preference. Um, I have had owners who insist they want to have incisors treated endodontically and um, particularly in a big dog on that lateral maxillary incisor, I would always rather do a root canal than extract it. They're not, you know, like I said, they're like mini canines. So um, there you go. All right, back to persistent deciduous teeth. Here we go. So two little um, maxillary canines there where there should only be one. There should always only ever be one tooth in, um, in a space at a time. So there's a rule of dentinal succession. And that says that no successional and deciduous precursor teeth should be erupted simultaneously or in competition for the same dental arcade space at any time. So they should not be there simultaneously ever. Um, this can lead to orthodontic problems. And now that we've talked about base narrow canines and all the palatal trauma and everything else that can occur from that, uh, I think we can all see how this might then um, result in, um, in an orthodontic issue for this dog here, right? Um, and that can, that can occur in as little as two weeks. So we really, really don't want to let these teeth stay um, in the same place uh, together. Um, even if this weren't causing an orthodontic problem, uh, we have the, the issue of having two teeth sharing the same gingival collar. So that means that in between those teeth where they're touching, there, there is no gingival attachment. So when you do get the, well, if you do get the, the deciduous tooth out, you're going to have a pocket there. If it stays there, you're going to have a pocket there. It's just going to be a place for plaque and bacteria and hair and everything else to get stuck and to cause periodontal disease in the future. So again, we don't like this. We don't, they should not be in the same place. And yes, here's our kitty cats. It happens in cats also. Um, not as commonly as in small dogs, but it can also happen in cats. All right. The next slide is to remind you how difficult these actually are to extract. If you don't have a little pill vial with a couple of cleaned up, bleached, um, saved deciduous teeth, uh, I strongly recommend it. Um, the next time you take these out and you get them out whole like this, um, put them in bleach overnight, save them and pull them out and show owners. I like to um, you know, put, my, put my fingers, hold the root, and just show people the crown and say, okay, this is what you can see, but this is what I have to deal with. Um, and it, it, it's definitely a, um, uh, it's a, it's a shocker to most people when they see this. And that's an incisor down below there. So even these incisors have extremely long roots. Um, and again, uh, radiography, dental radiology is going to be really, really important for these. Uh, but again, once the owners can see what you're actually having to deal with, it, it, they, they can better appreciate the time, the care, the skill, um, and the cost of taking these out. Um, I do think that these should cost more than $15 to extract, frankly. They're hard and they're not easy. Uh, question, should the deciduous teeth be removed as soon as you see the beginning of eruption of the secondary tooth? Yes, yes. They should not be competing for the same place and they should not be taking up the same, uh, the same space. So if you see this happening at, um, you know, the dog is four months old and it's not coming in for its neuter surgery for another two months, do not wait until, you know, don't leave it in there for two months because the damage is already going to be done. Now, sometimes you can tell that, uh, especially with like incisors, you can tell that they're about to fall out. Um, I've been able to help um, certain sometimes baby teeth exfoliate in the room. Um, I have also had it that, you know, okay, 
we're going to set up the appointment. You're going to come back, you know, it's Friday afternoon, coming back on Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, whatever. And we're going to take the teeth out. And then they call me and they say it fell out over the weekend. Great. Super. Um, but I'm not going to leave it in there. Um, okay. That's that. Here is the next thing is an x-ray um, showing you exactly why x-ray is so important with these. Okay, so if you can appreciate, this is all root here. Um, that root is not resorbing and it's not going anywhere, um, but you have this nice little spot here where the permanent canine was putting pressure on the crown of this tooth and weakened it, right? So when you go to elevate this, chances are good you're gonna break it right here. Do you just leave it there? You do not. You do not just leave it there because that root is not resorbing at all. And it's, it's if you leave it, it is then a very, um, very large potential for infection. Uh, so don't just leave roots behind. Sometimes you'll x-ray these uh, and you can tell the root is mostly resorbed. I don't think I actually have a picture of it, but um, you can see the root is almost completely gone. You're in luck, right? Um, so you saw this dog, it's four and a half months old, it's 16, it's 18 weeks, whatever it is. And the permanent canines coming in and you're like, okay, we got to get those baby canines out. We're just going to go ahead. Maybe this is totally up to you. I know there are a whole lot of different, um, opinions now about early spay and neuter, um, but you could, you might elect to just go ahead and neuter the dog at the time you're taking the deciduous canines out rather than waiting to take the deciduous canines out until some arbitrary time that you're going to neuter the dog. If it's a large breed dog and you're not planning to neuter it until it's 18 months old anyway, well, great. You still need to get it under to take the deciduous canines out, right? Luckily, um, that's not the most common scenario. All right, so, yeah. So this is just a, a friendly reminder to me to point out that the permanent mandibular canines generally come in lingual to the deciduous ones. All right, so um, that is their normal eruption path. They usually come in right there. And that is important as we get back into discussing the, the previous question about can you damage um, the teeth, the permanent teeth when you're extracting these deciduous ones. All right, so yeah, so this is just another, another x-ray um, showing you these big permanent uh, mandibular canines, and this is just a different angle. That's the deciduous one right there. All right, and same thing on the other side over here. Okay. Supernumerary teeth. They're exactly what they sound like. It's just extra teeth. Um, this happens. Um, you can see here you've got a first premolar, a second premolar, a third premolar, another third premolar, and then the fourth premolar. Um, these are not always problematic, um, although they can be. In that, in, in this case, I, they're probably not an issue. You've got a little bit of crowding between the second premolar and the first third premolar, um, but um, you know, you have to watch that for, for uh, debris and periodontal disease, but um, this happens in cats as well. Um, that's way too crowded. <laughs> that's going to cause problems for the cat, so we definitely want to go in and treat that. All right, so this one, this was a fun case. This is the first one of these I've ever seen. This is that same, uh, the vet student's dog. Of course it's the vet student's dog, because why wouldn't it be the vet student's dog? Um, you know, I thought we were just going to be dealing with this lanced canine um, and this un under erupted, the infra erupted um, mandibular canine. Uh, but when I was doing my exam, um, I 
saw this bump. I'm like, ah, what is that? What's going on? Well, we took x-rays and ta-da, he had three canines. Um, so, and I've lost my pointer now. I'm really sorry, guys, but my phone just completely died. Um, so this is a third over there on the, on the, hopefully you guys can see that without me having to point it out. Um, there are one, two, three canine teeth there. Um, that was that nice little bump and we extracted it and there it is over on the right side. Um, so that was kind of a that was kind of a nifty nifty little thing. Now, if you remember from the previous photos that I showed of that dog, that the mandibular canine um, was under erupted. It hadn't come all the way in, and I could explain that from the fact that it was banging on the the um, mesioverse maxillary canine. Um, however, it also probably had something to do with this. <laughs> uh, this is on the same side of the mouth. So once we got that out, the um, the more normal mandibular canine was able to finish erupting. If you look down at the bottom at the apices of, of these tooth roots, you can see how much less erupted that, that tooth is compared to the other side. So just kind of a, a really fun gee whiz thing. There's a question, how do you know which is the true permanent tooth and which is the supernumerary? Uh, in this case, um, it's I think it's, pretty obvious um, you know even if it's yeah it's pretty obvious in this case that the bigger one is the is the this is the true permanent tooth um, you know again examining this uh, with you know good um, with a good clear eye at you know just grossly what does everything look like how crowded are the teeth um, is one of them rotated uh, is one of them causing problems and the other one not so much causing problems? It it really um, it really just kind of depends. And then again, looking at your X-ray to try and determine. Sometimes there will be abnormalities in the roots. Uh, like I said, in this one, it was pretty clear which one was not normal and which one I was going to want to remove. In that cat picture, I would take both of those out. Um, I, I guess the short answer is that it doesn't really matter which one is the true permanent tooth. Uh, well, they're both permanent tooth, permanent teeth, but does it, it doesn't really matter um, whether it, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. If it's causing a problem, it's causing a problem, whether it was supposed to be there or whether it's an extra one. Sometimes, you know, you just take out the ones that are, that are causing the problems. Okay. Um, Yes, there were three permanent canines in that case. That was a, a, a question. Yes, there were three permanent canines. One was smaller, but it was definitely a canine. Um, it just didn't have much room to grow. Um, and it was also impeding. Can you all still hear me? Um, there were three permanent canines in that case. Uh, let's see. How did I close if the more lingual canine was removed? Um, it, it actually closed up pretty easily. I, I um, let me see if I can go back. Um, I made just an incision, just kind of along the, mm, between the teeth um, and along what would be that, that arcade. So, and then I just elevated it from the lingual side of, the erupted, the partially erupted canine tooth, and really just kind of popped it out. So I just made a flap on the on the lingual side of this whole thing. It came out really easily, and it closed it closed really well. So that was pretty easy. Um, do I remove deciduous teeth even if they are not causing any problems? Mm -hmm. No. Um, there are cases again. You know, you have to have X-ray. You need to make sure that there's a permanent tooth there because if you remove a deciduous tooth and there is no permanent tooth behind it, um, the, uh, the people could be really upset when no permanent tooth erupts. So, and that happens a lot. I see it a lot in, in small, small dogs um, where there's just a, a deciduous tooth that's just there and there's, that never got a canine tooth and there is no, can, there, I'm sorry, not canine tooth, there is no permanent tooth behind there. 
Um, if it's not causing a problem, if it is healthy, if it is, you know, there's no reason to take it out. Um, however, uh, I have found that oftentimes, you know, a year or two years later, we end up taking them out. They, they just don't seem to hold up as well as, um, uh, as well as true permanent teeth do. Um, tips or tricks to making maxillary deciduous canine extraction easier. So um, the first tip and trick that I have is uh, your instruments. <laughs> you wanna have good, sharp instruments. I have a, um, a Luxator that I absolutely love for these. It's made by a company called Syslac and it's just got a longer, um, the, the, the working shank part of it is longer than on just a typical um, luxating, uh, on a, a, a typical luxator. So it's sharp at the tip, um, it's very thin, um, and it's just got a really nice face that I can slip down in between the teeth. Um, so good, sharp, um, delicate instruments um, that are well-maintained uh, and, very careful, gentle, um, gentle twisting, gentle um, elevation. You do have to be really careful with these, getting them out that you don't damage the, the tooth bud behind. Um, often with deciduous canines, if I've seen that there is a, a big long root like that, I will make an incision. Uh, it makes my life much easier. It makes everything much easier. Um, and I just have to throw in, you know, one or two stitches um, and the dog does great, it makes everybody happier. Um, in, in general practice, you know, a lot of the time we were doing these, of course, when the dog was under for something else. Um, and sometimes one other trick or tip is to start elevating it and then just let it bleed. So elevate it a little bit, get it, get the periodontal space all kind of nice and bloody, um, let it get it bleedy so that it's kind of actively bleeding. That's going to put some pressure on the ligament and kind of help ease things along. Go do something else. If you're going to spay the dog, go ahead, spay the dog, and then come back um, and finish, finish elevating. Sometimes that makes it a little bit easier, but really um, good, sharp, delicate instrumentation, um, x-rays, x-rays, x-rays always, uh, and make, make life easy on yourself and go ahead and make a little incision. Uh, okay, fractured deciduous teeth. Um, here's one and it's ugly. Um, this is, you know, fractured baby teeth can break just as can permanent teeth and treatment is, it's not exactly the same, but your options are similar. The thing that you should not be telling people is, oh, just wait for the baby tooth to put, wait, wait for the permanent tooth to push this one out. It'll be fine. It won't necessarily be fine. One, you don't know for sure that A, is there a permanent tooth there? B, is that permanent tooth going to come in in the right place to push this baby tooth out? And C, even more important, um, exposed pulp like this means that there's infection. It, there's an open pathway for all the bacteria in the world and in the dog's mouth to get right up into that tooth and cause infection. So um, don't just leave them. It's contraindicated. This tooth should be extracted and it should be extracted um, sooner than later. All right. Um, yeah. So here's, here's where we get into the talk about permanent tooth buds. So there are permanent tooth buds underneath these deciduous teeth. So this infection in this open pulp, it can get, it, it can lead the infection right down into the permanent tooth buds. All right. Um, and that wouldn't be good because now when, when and if the permanent tooth erupts, it's going to be damaged in some way, okay? So 
we we want to take these out. You don't want to leave them. Um, don't just wait. And that brings us also to enamel hypocalcification. So this is one of those things that can happen. This um, uh, this image is of probably the most common cause of this is damage to the tooth bud during deciduous canine extraction, all right? Um, any insult or trauma to the ameloblast can cause an enamel malformation. And, and that enamel is then very easily lost, okay? Um, like I said, this is really typical for damage that was done during a deciduous tooth extraction. And that's the most common case of an acquired enamel hypocalcification or enamel hypoplasia. Um, so, and you can see on this tooth, there's not only this kind of big, ugly brown thing kind of in the middle of the tooth, but there's also damage to the enamel closer to the gingival margin, more minor, but, um, but definitely there. So if you bump, when, when you're taking these deciduous canines out, these deciduous teeth out, because it can happen on any of them. Um, if you are too aggressive, if your instruments are used inappropriately or not sharp enough and just, you know, you have trouble, and it happens to everybody. We've all done this. Every one of us has done this. Um, you can bump that enamel um, organ the, on the tooth bud and cause a cause damage to the enamel. You're not gonna know it until the permanent tooth comes in. All right, and then you're gonna have to deal with it. Um, luckily, it's not terribly difficult to deal with, uh, but this is why I remind you that those mandibular canines tend to come in lingually. So if you're being really aggressive on the lingual side of that deciduous mandibular canine, you run a greater risk of damaging the 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 bud there okay um but we can fix them so this is the same tooth um that's had composite restorations done all right uh and just a friendly reminder here that um just remember that exposed dentin um is is sensitive um if you've chipped your tooth um or had a deep cavity um, those dental tubules are open and it's an indirect exposure of the pulp and the nerves, um, the nerves and the blood vessels. So not only will it be sensitive to sucking air over your tooth or drinking something hot or cold, um, but it also is a possible route of, of infection. So uh, we do want to treat these teeth. You don't want to just leave them, leave them be. Um, okay, if the deciduous tooth is only fractured at the very tip and the tooth is not discolored, do you tell the owner to keep an eye on it or do you recommend extraction and x-rays ASAP? Um, if you can be sure that there's no pulp exposure, then you might be okay waiting. But again, exposed dentin is a potential route for ascending infection, right? So I still think um, it's, it's, for me, I would always rather err on the side of caution. I would rather get in there and find out, oh, you know, there's no pulp exposure and it looks like it's okay, but I went ahead and took it out for you anyway. Uh, just because, you know, bombed it once, maybe, I, you know, I don't know. That's, it's a case by case basis. Um, I can't tell you for sure. Sometimes, you know, an awake exam is a difficult thing to do. And even if I'm pretty sure there's not pulp exposure on a tooth, again, we've all been fooled by that. And once we get the animal under anesthesia, even though we were pretty certain there wasn't going to be any pulp exposure, there actually was. Um, case in point, it, it happened to me on a different situation, but a dog with um, worn teeth that I was like, yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think it's into the pulp. And sure enough, twice in two weeks, it was, it was into the pulp. So um, you just cannot be certain in an awake exam. All right. Um, this is a more generalized enamel hypocalcification. Um, and this can occur 
secondary, you can see it's affecting kind of all these teeth, right? Um, from the canines all the way back. And this can occur secondarily to an infectious um, or nutritional, some kind of systemic insult during tooth development. Um, so the teeth kind of appear stained and the enamel just flakes right off. Um, so we always talk about, we often hear about uh, tetracycline or flor fluoridosis are two possible causes of this, also viral, um, like I said, nutritional um, infections. Um, tetracycline, we think, really only causes staining, not so much this true hypocalcification where the stuff just kind of flakes off. Um, and so we do treat these teeth again. Um, this is this is not good enamel. It's not going to do a good job of protecting the teeth. It's ugly, um, and these teeth can be sensitive. So we do actually treat these. This is the same mouth. I think it's actually the other side of the mouth, but it's the same mouth, same dog. Um, this is after just smoothing and bonded sealant. So sometimes we use composite restorations on certain teeth. Um, it all depends on the dog. It all depends on the tooth. But this is just smoothing um, and bonded sealant. Um, so root malformation um, is not uncommon at all when you have these more widespread uh, hypoplasias, enamel hypoplasia, enamel hypocalcification. So you should take x-rays of these teeth. Um, so when we're talking about treating these, you know, the aim of treatment is to eliminate sensitivity, prevent endodontic infection, uh, and then smoothing the tooth surface so that we can decrease plaque retention and thereby decrease the risk of periodontal disease. Um, these guys do, um, they generally require coming back <laughs> regularly on a regular basis because you do oftentimes have to maintain these, you know, they'll, they'll chip the teeth again. Um, I've, you know, I've had a couple that looked like they were going to be okay, and we ended up having to extract a couple of teeth later because uh, the damage was just too severe. Um, that's it. Let's see. Are there any questions on that? Oh, the manufacturer of the Luxator that I like for deciduous teeth is called Cislac. It's C-I-S-L-A-K. Um, they make some really, really nice. I use a lot of their stuff. Um, I use in really small patients and feline patients. I just they have a lot of really nice, very delicate instruments. So my my surgical packs are a mishmash. I've got a lot of Miltex. I've got a lot of Syslac stuff. It's just kind of instruments that I've found. I really, I like the way they feel. I like the way they work. Um, can I recommend a video on Luxator and elevator sharpening? You know, I can't. Um, I know there is a lot of stuff out there, but I don't have one that I would just recommend. Um, I know that some of my study buddies are on this call and maybe they want to type in um, some, some answers to that. Oops, didn't mean to go there. When do I choose composite over bonded sealants? Mm. Um, so composite is best in certain areas. Uh, and then different composites are better in some areas than others. So again, this is this is one of those things. It I don't have um, a really simple answer for you. Um, a lot of it is just experience and um, experience. <laughs> um, bonded sealants, uh, occlusal surface. Well, so no, that depends too. Um, and I think you guys, I think I might be losing my, my, uh, earbuds here, but I'm not sure. Um, it looks like it's still working. Um, okay. So for these massive mounts like this, where there's just a whole, whole lot to do, um, bonded sealants are faster and easier. So that's one consideration for sure. Some of the consideration is also, owner preference and, um, and cost. Um, yeah, so 
I don't have a, a, a really good simple answer for you there. I'm sorry. Missing piece. Okay, we're getting we're getting close now, guys. I think this is good having the question taking longer. I didn't think I was going to be able to stretch it out. Here we go. Okay, missing teeth. There are four reasons a tooth may be missing. Um, and missing teeth should always be radiographed. All right. So it could have been extracted. It could have exfoliated or fallen out. Um, maybe it was broken and broken below the gum line, or there is a retained root in there somewhere. It could be unerupted, um, or it could never have been there. And the last two are probably the more common ones that we see in our pediatric patients, although any of them can occur in any age dog. Um, okay, so this dog is missing its um, right mandibular first premolar, the 405. Um, and if you notice too, the canine tooth is infra erupted, less erupted than it should be. And here's an x-ray. So uh, if you can, if I can see, I can't see my own screen. Um, so this little tooth is, this is actually not the same dog, sorry about that. Um, but this first, that's still the first premolar and you can see it's laying sideways. Super, super common. Um, it's laying completely horizontally. So it didn't erupt all the way. You can see it, the, the side of the crown is kind of through the bone, but then there is this black area around part of the crown because it didn't erupt and it continued to, um, continue to generate uh, uh, products there. So this is what we would call a dentigerous cyst. Um, dentigerous cysts generally, uh, they typically will surround the crown of an incompletely formed or incompletely erupted tooth. All right. Um, we can also get things called primordial cysts. Those occur when a tooth germ develops, but then it undergoes cystic degradation um, before it gets dented in enamel. Um, so those will actually be edentulous spaces. You won't see the tooth in there at all, and there'll just be um, a, a cyst around it. Okay. Um, there's another, another example of a cyst. These can be really pretty hugely destructive. Um, they can affect adjacent teeth. They can weaken the bone severely. Here is an example of a dog. You can see those teeth are all just really not right. <laughs> That's an, an ADR dog for sure. Um, and here's what the x-ray looks like. So back on this picture, you can see on the, on the bottom there, there's a little bit of a canine tooth erupted on the one side, but not at all on the other. And then one, two, three, four incisors. Well, there are one, two, three, four, five incisors on the x-ray and the unerupted um, canine is laying pretty horizontal. And then this big cyst um, around the partially erupted, erupted um, canine tooth. Uh, and so this dog, you know, is going to lose this canine tooth. It's going to lose his incisors. And actually, that one tooth looks broken. Um, it's probably going to lose that premolar over there next to the cyst. Uh, and you just don't have a lot of bone, so this is going to be this is going to be fairly weak. Um, fairly weak in bone. And let me see here. And there's just another one. So this one doesn't seem to have formed a cyst at all at this point. Um, it is laying horizontally. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. Is that a supernumerary tooth? So um, what's going on there? Um, I think the general rule is that if if it's a seven, eight, nine-year-old dog and it's got one of these, but there's no cyst and it hasn't been a problem, you can probably just watch and wait. But in young dogs, I think it's it's much better to get these out and not deal with a problem. I think they become a problem more often than not. All right, let me try and catch up with a couple of questions before we go on to this next thing here. Um, a client with a border collie with genetic 
genetic uh, rain syndrome, so genetic teeth hypo, genetic enamel hypoplasia, roots are normal on x-ray. Would you restore the teeth and repeat as required as a likely damage again? Yes, this is exactly what I would do. Um, why are we seeing more unerupted teeth? I used to see it rarely, but now quite frequently, and also large breed dogs. Yeah, I see it in large breed dogs too. Um, really, I think that the reason we're seeing more is we see so many small dogs. Um, I mean, you know, how many Boston <laughs> have you seen with unerupted teeth? Um, and I think the other thing, honestly, is that we're looking. Uh, we have dental x-ray in the 18 years since I graduated vet school um, has become much, much, much more popular and more accessible. More people have it. Yay, us. That's all really good. Um, so I think we're looking more. Um, you know, clients ask me this all the time. I, we had dogs my whole life. We never had this many teeth problems. Well, one, we just didn't look for them, I think is, is, is a big part of it. Um, what age would you leave it? Uh, an erupt, if you see an uninterrupted tooth and no cysts, when would you leave it? I think, you know, if it's been there six, seven, eight years, it's probably okay. Um, but you do need to take a couple of different angles on your x-ray. Um, remember, x-ray is uh, one, it's a two-dimensional image of a, of a three-dimensional object. So you need to try and get some different views to make sure um, that there is no cyst there. Um, do the cyst peel once the tooth is out? Do you have to debride it? Yes, you absolutely have to debride it. Thanks for asking so that I didn't run away and, and not answer that question. Um, you do, you need to get all of the cyst lining out. Uh, these things are pretty, uh, it's pretty obvious to cyst once you get in there, you know, you open it up and the stuff squirts out at you and you have that very typical, very shiny cyst lining. You have to debride it completely. You have to get all of that out. Um, and I always, always, always send it for biopsy. Always. Just to be sure. <laughs> Um, that's part of the estimate that the owner gets. Um, if you do not get all of the cyst lining out, yes, it can come back. And I just did one uh, earlier this week, actually, or last week. I don't know. My days are all running together. But uh, it had been done a while back, and it came right back. And, um, yeah, it's just a huge, nasty cyst. Um, so, yes, you have to debride it. Um, you may have to take out adjacent teeth. Um, and in that case, do I use artificial bone to fill the space of the cyst? Um, again, it depends. If it's really, really weakened, um, it sometimes makes me feel better to put some bone graft material in there, yes. Um, we've gotten really away from using console for almost anything, although this is one of those things that I might consider using it for. Um, more often than not, I just debride the heck out of it, make sure that these can be difficult to close <clears throat> because you end up with a really big defect. Um, so yeah, uh, sometimes, um, but you just need to make sure that you have a really good flap and that no tension when, when you suture it all up. Um, do I have any advice on extracting an uninterrupted 305, 405? I always worry about being so close to the roots of the canine and the second premolar. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> um, I just, um, I approach it boggily, so make a nice big flap so that you can see everything. Um, and then I'll remove bone kind of from the top and the buccal side down until I can find it. Um, if I'm having a hard time locating it, I'll use a needle and take another x-ray to see if I'm in the right spot. That's about all the tricks I have for that. So um, we are almost done, guys. Papillomatosis. Um, I think we've all seen it. It can be kind of gross. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This is a Popova virus and it is considered benign and self-limiting. Um, will generally self-resolve, um, although sometimes that can take months. Uh, it's usually weeks to months. Um, however, remember that these things can get really, really big. <clears throat> excuse me, and they can interfere with mastication or they can become infected. Um, you know, if you're just chewing on your own big old warts all the time, it's not going to feel really great. 
Um, they can mimic more aggressive tumors, and there are reports of <laughs> transformation to malignant squamous cell carcinoma. So there is a, a subcategory of, <clears throat> of squamous cell carcinoma that is believed to be related to this. That's all I have to say about it. Um, I don't see a lot of it. Cleft palates, again, um, don't see a ton of these. Uh, they're generally congenital, but palatine defects can occur secondarily to trauma, burns, um, or cancer. So electrical cords, um, that kind of thing. Um, congenitally, you'll see these in really young animals and they're unthrifty, not suckling well, sneezing milk, um, all that kind of good stuff. <clears throat> the hard palate defects, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a drink of water here real quick. Hard palate defects are usually midline. Um, they're generally associated with a midline soft palate defect as well, which you can see way on the left in the dark shadowed part of, of this photo. Um, these are not usually externally evident. So the signs are gonna be, you know, poor suckling, unthrifty, failure to thrive, um, sneezing and nasal discharge. The more rostral ones that are up in the incisive, you can see the um, cleft lip, cleft, pal um, cleft lip, cleft palate is what we're talking about. Um, those are, a, a, they're a little bit different. The thing to remember though about these, um, a couple of things to remember, one, the, the defect, the bony defect is going to be larger than the soft tissue defect, all right? Um, they're bigger. Um, your best chance at curing this is your first surgery. Subsequent surgeries, sometimes we have to stage them. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you try and fix this all in one go um, and it doesn't, take the first time, uh, subsequent surgeries will be more difficult. You just end up with less tissue and harder to get a tension-free closure um, and all of that because it is. Tension-free closure is super important. You want your suture line to be over bone so that you can avoid the trampoline effect. Um, gentle tissue handling techniques. You need to debride your edges. Um, and you have to make sure that you maintain your blood supply. So you need to preserve this palatine artery, which is what this picture is showing. All right. Um, ideally, you're going to close these in two layers. Um, and you have to really carefully make the flaps and then move them. Um, this is honestly, uh, I, I would prefer this if I could, right? Um, you know, you, some people really enjoy doing these. Um, I've done some smaller ones. I've not done a huge one like this yet. Um, I do actually really enjoy fixing them, um, but it, it's not for the faint at heart and it definitely requires um, considerable practice. So make sure you, um, here we go. This is what it looks like when it's all fixed, all right. Um, but remember, your underlying defect is going to be bigger than your soft tissue defect, for sure. Let me see. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Mathis. Um, she's put some YouTube links on sharpening in the chat box for everybody. Um, thank you very much. Um, how do I treat papillomas? Uh, I don't, really. I don't see them. You guys deal with these way more than I do. Um, when I was still doing general practice, um, I mostly just left them alone. Um, you know, those really massive ones or the, the uh, really generalized ones, I think some people treat them by crushing. I don't know, what are you guys doing these days? Um, uh, I've heard so many mixed things about this. Um, I always just told people basically watch and wait, give it a few months and hopefully it's gonna go away. And if it doesn't, then we'll deal with it. Um, the reason for moving away from console in our practices um, is that some of the more, you know, we were, we were really keen on it um, several years ago. Um, our main reasons are that we have better products out there now. Um, console is really just, it's more of a, a scaffold than anything. And um, there have been studies that show that it, it really doesn't do anything. I mean, it, it sits there, which might be exactly what you want. 
um, in certain situations, but it's not good at regrowing bones. We have things that are much better at doing that. Okay. Um, odontomas. So, um, odontomas are masses that occur when there is a disturbance in the development of the tooth. So, um, the enamel, the dentin, the cementum. So, you can get teeth um, that are formed, but irregularly mixed in this mineralized mass. So, they're benign, which is good, right? Um, and they're just kind of these big icks, and this is what they can look like on, on x-ray. Um, and it's just this kind of weird amorphous thing. And when you, you open this up, it'll be full of pieces of teeth. Or sometimes little, what we call denticles, um, which are little teeth. <laughs> so they have, denticles have all of the different parts of a tooth. Um, they're just not, they're just malformed. They're not, mm, they don't form into a nice looking tooth. Um, so that's a, that is a comatoma. It has all of the parts of the tooth are there, but it's just kind of uh, disorganized amorphous mass. Um, and you just remove all of the little denticles, all of the associated teeth, um, and the fibrovascular stroma that's, that's around there. A compound odontoma, you'll have um, um, all the little, those are the ones with denticles. So you get all of these little tooth-like structures that are around a kind of a normal tooth. Okay, so that's just kind of a gee whiz thing, um, kind of fun. Um, our last thing, feline juvenile gingivitis, um, or feline juvenile, I need to change the slide, feline juvenile gingivitis and periodontitis, all right? So this is something that we see occurring in young cats. <coughs> gingivitis, um, we generally see this before they're a year old, all right, um, up to two years of age. Um, I, this is, in my, in, in my experience, this is often confused with caudal stomatitis. It is not the same thing. And we see kind of, there are kind of two different, um, different forms of this. So you have this, um, gingivitis and hyperplasia. So you can see in this one, especially around the incisors, you get just this really big gingival overgrowth. Um, this kind of thing you can see uh, kind of associated with tooth eruption, um, but there's no bone loss. It's not periodontal disease. You, you don't have bone loss. The teeth aren't loose. Um, you don't have frocational defects, that kind of thing. Um, and to treat this, uh, you want to do gingivectomy, you want to get rid of the excessive tissue, and you want to keep, get these teeth really, really clean. So that means home care, which can be quite challenging for most cat owners. Um, it's not impossible, it can be done. It takes, um, <laughs> uh, it takes some bravery, some courage, uh, and you just some stick to itiveness. Um, and uh, a food motivated cat helps. But um, so home care and frequent professional cleanings to get down under the gums and to address any hyperplasia that is recurring, okay? Um, maybe if you're doing this and with home care, you're doing anesthetized um, cleanings every four months or so. Um, the hope is that you get this cat through this period and as they mature and they, they are a more adult cat, um, they kind of grow out of this, all right? Um, if you can't do home care, you might be having to clean this cat's teeth professionally every month. I mean, it could be every four weeks. Um, I don't know a lot of clients who are going to be really, really keen on doing this. Um, but don't make that decision for your clients. You would be amazed at what people are willing to willing to do for their pets, um, or maybe you won't because we're all veterinarians. So, um, so 
yeah, so the hyperplasia and gingivitis, um, frequent cleanings, home care, gingivectomy, all of these um, may be overrepresented in, um, or Siamese and Maine Coons may be overrepresented for that, all right? Um, remember though that it can progress, just like all gingivitis, it can progress to periodontal disease. So the other kind of form of this that we see is feline juvenile periodontitis. And I more often than not end up doing full mouth or near full mouth extractions on these cats. And they are young, um, but they have horrible, this is the hyperplasia in the incisors. Um, they can have um, horrible, horrible um, uh, bone loss um, and things like that. And I'm sorry, I don't have an x-ray of it, uh, but it's a pretty typical looking, it's bone loss, right? You get for occasional defects. The teeth might be mobile. You can, you know, you see gingival recession. Um, you can see the roots of the teeth when you're looking in these cat's mouth. The key thing is that it is not caudal stomatitis. So remember always to take a really good look at the back of the mouth. And if you have the bilateral caudal to the dental arcades, if you have the inflammation there, you are probably looking at a stomatitis cat, not a feline juvenile gingivitis periodontitis cat, okay? So the treatment with juvenile periodontitis can end up being the same though, because you can end up with full or near full mouth extractions on these guys because the stuff, it's just so destructive, so massively destructive. Um, uh, so that's it. But again, um, cats under a year of age, uh, they're, they're babies, they're little and up to two, but um, young, um, possibly viral related. Um, and I think in the destructive types also, um, we see it more often in some of the purebreds, the Himalayans, the Burmese, the Abyssinians, the Siamese, all those, all those fun, fun things. So um, let me see here. I'm going to turn my video back on and say hi to everybody. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Hopefully this was a, a, a good overview for you guys of um, uh, some of the pediatric stuff that we see that we count on you guys to find for us um, since we don't get to see them. Um, I like seeing baby dogs, <laughs> but I don't get to see a lot. You're very welcome. Um, we're really happy somebody said thank you 